Good evening. I'm uh, Manuel Bach. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. And before I turn things over to our uh, Master of Ceremonies, I just wanted to, uh, to thank Dr. Paul Westman for uh, joining us tonight and uh, for his presentation. And uh, I also want to thank all of you. I th thank the committee for putting this event together, uh, led by Julie Bray Ali, Professor of Astronomy. Uh, but yes, absolutely. We can give them all a hand. Uh, but I did want to take the opportunity up front to introduce uh, uh, my uh, board colleagues. Uh, one of them is still on his way, and so maybe uh, I'll go ahead and introduce him anyway. But we do have uh, Laura Santos, Trustee Laura Santos, who's on the Board of Trustees with me. And then also our student trustee, Juan Mendoza, is with us this evening. Juan, if you could just wave there. And he's sitting there next to uh, Trustee Santos. And then uh, Gary Chow will be joining us a bit later. And I believe that Jay Chin is not able to, to join us, but uh, his uh, wife, uh, Karen Chang, was uh, going to be uh, representing him this evening. So uh, thank you again very much for your support for the Kepler um, Student Scholarship. Uh, we have some really marvelous students that we've had over the years, but I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to leave others to speak to it. Um, our president, uh, Bill Scroggins, is here, but uh, he will be speaking to you in a little bit. He'll be introduced by our MC, who is John Batulo. And, and John, could you please take over before I get long-winded? <laughs> So I'll pass the torch to the, the uh, very able John Batula. Thank you so much, Dr. Baca. Good evening, everybody. How are you? We're back in person. How does that feel? Fantastic. Fantastic. On behalf of the entire committee, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the 13th Annual Kepler Distinguished Lecture and Scholarship Dinner. In the past 13 years, we've awarded scholarships to a significant number of Mount Sac students. You can see an update about many of their accomplishments in your program. We have also featured a tremendous lineup of renowned scientists as our keynote speakers. You will also find some of that information in your program. But best of all, we have raised thousands and thousands of dollars for our students. We have much to be proud of and much to look forward to as we embark on tonight's program. Now, as some of you might remember last year, due to COVID, we met in cyberspace. You see what I did there with that word? And in order to recognize our amazing students, uh, but this year we're back, and not only are we back, we are here in the beautiful Heritage Hall, overlooking Mount Sac's world-class new stadium. So I hope you had an opportunity to kind of look around check out the museum and the beautiful space that we're in tonight. What a difference a year makes. And with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the president and CEO of Mount San Antonio College, Dr. Bill Scroggins. Dr. Scroggins. Thank you, John. On behalf of the Mount San Antonio College Board of Trustees, Welcome to the Kepler Lecture and Scholarship Dinner. It's a great event, but it takes many people to make it a great event. Uh, I'd like to first recognize your opening uh, speaker, our Dean of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Manuel Baca, who is the creator and sustainer of the Kepler Lecture and Scholarship series. Thank you, Dr. Baca, for your vision. It takes a lot of work to put this event together, and you should know that the faculty in the departments of Earth Science and Astronomy work very hard every year to plan and put this together, and particularly, you see the work of their students and the work that they put together of the items to bid on. I hope you're out there bidding because that's an important part of our fundraising tonight. I'd also like to thank the Mount San Antonio College Foundation 
who also sponsors this event, and the executive director, Bill Lambert, because this is a foundation fundraising event that goes all of the proceeds raised through this dinner and these auctions and your bidding goes to support student scholarships to improve the success and equity performance of our students. And so please don't hesitate to meet our students and ask them piercing questions on physics, which I just did to one of the young ladies who answered everyone perfectly. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank all of you for your being here and your financial support for our scholarships. Your community involvement with Mount San Antonio College and its philanthropy is very much appreciated. Without you, we couldn't be the college that we are today. You are very student-centered. You are very much part of our family. So enjoy yourselves tonight. Now this is one of my favorite events because it's in partnership with the, uh, the NASA and uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratories because we get to hear their scientists each time. As you know, I'm a scientist, so I always look forward to what we hear tonight. So you're going to hear tonight about landing on the head of a comet. Isn't that amazing? So enjoy your evening. Ask plenty of questions to our speaker. And again, thank you for your participation and your generosity. Thank you very much, Dr. Scroggins. And thank you for your amazing support that you provide the Kepler program. And the many students have been recipients in its services and awards. I don't know about you, but I'm so excited for tonight's lecture about comets. Now, comet, incidentally, uh, is dinosaurs' least favorite reindeer. Is it too soon for that? Too soon, I think? Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, as Dr. Scroggin said, the silent auction is still going on till 7 o'clock p.m., so you be sure to keep bidding on some of those items. As you saw, there's lots of cool things out there. Great gift baskets, meteorites, wine, and more wine. So go ahead and bid on those items. Now, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce my boss, the Dean of Natural Sciences Division, Matt Judd. But with mixed emotions, I have to say I have a little bit of sadness, a little bit of excitement for him, and a little bit of envy. I'd like to share with all of you that Dean Judd will be retiring this August after 35 years of service to Mount Sac. For the past 15 years, he's been a staunch supporter of the Kepler program. And as he makes it, well, he's made his way here already. I ask that you help me thank him for all of his years of service by giving a huge round of applause. This is Matt, De uh, Matt Judd, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Dr. Scroggins. This is one of our, our favorite events. And part of what I love about this event is the amazing collaboration. It's the collaboration not only of our Earth Sciences and Astronomy Department, but many faculty within the Natural Sciences. And this year, that collaboration stretches farther than it ever has. We're here in the athletics complex, thanks to Dean Joe Jenham and his marvelous staff and their generosity in letting us use this amazing space. And tonight, your meal is being prepared by our culinary students from Je Dean Jennifer Galbris um, Hotel and Restaurant Management Program and culinary programs. So this is truly a collaborative event that showcases the amazing talents of our students. And you're going to see, if, if you talk to our students out in the lobby, you're going to see they're doing amazing work. And this night celebrates that. Again, as Dr. Scroggin said, I want to thank you for the support for the many years, the thousands of dollars that we've been able to give to students to further their education and help them move on. Um, it's been a tremendous, tremendous success. I want to recognize some other folks who are here tonight. Um, Stan Liu from the City Council Member of Diamond Bar is here tonight. We also have Willie Lee Daniels, who's a retired United Airlines pilot and founder of the nonprofit organization Shades of Blue. He is the 2017 Mount SAC Alumnus of the Year. <laughs> I 
I need to recognize my mentor and the Dean Emeritus of Natural Sciences who has been a staunch supporter of this event from its very inception. We wouldn't have a Kepler without Larry Renger. Dean Renger, can you give us a wave? And his name's not on my list, but I did see Tony Trong. Are you, are you here? Where's Tony? Thank you, Tony. We appreciate your ongoing support of Mount SAC. We also have an amazing team of administrators and deans, many of whom are here tonight. I'd like to recognize my boss, Vice President of Instruction, Kelly Fowler, who's here. This is her first time getting to experience the Kepler, so we're really excited that she's here with us. Also, Vice President of Administrative Services, Morris Rodriguez. <laughs> Megan Chen, our Associate Vice President of Instruction. <laughs> and there are a lot of other deans, faculty, and staff here tonight. We can't do it without their support. We have an amazingly supportive environment at this college. I want to thank Dr. Scroggins, who when this event was just getting started, we wanted to raise some money, we wanted to have scholarships, and, but we needed a little seed money. And he was absolutely right there from the beginning to say, whatever you need, this is a great event, it's going to be really good for students. And I think that's at the core of what we do here at Mount SAC. We ask ourselves if it's good for students, and then we find a way to make that happen. So again, thank you all for being here tonight on behalf of the Natural Sciences Division and our outstanding programs, faculty, staff, and students. I welcome you. Thank you so much, Dean Judd. I know the Kepler Committee members are very appreciative of your participation and ongoing support of the program, and we wish you the best in your retirement. Just a reminder, you can still keep bidding until 7 o'clock, so get those bids in. Now, is anybody getting hungry? Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. You know, I was so shocked to learn that astronauts never get very hungry once they get into space. I guess it's because they had a big launch. <laughs> now, as you enjoy your dinner tonight, as Dean Judd said, the meal was prepared and catered by our very own Mount Sac students who are part of our culinary arts program. Mount Sac even has its own restaurant, I don't know if you heard, called Cafe 91, which is delicious. Incidentally, you may not have heard that along with purchasing Twitter, Elon Musk has also opened his own restaurant on the moon. I hear it has great food, but no atmosphere. <laughs> Everybody enjoy your meal and I'll be back a little later. And uh, the first item we're going to uh, raffle off is a beautiful necklace with the sun and the moon on it. All right, and Dr. Baca, would you mind pulling some tickets for us? <laughs> All right, get ready with your tickets. First ticket is 174874. Once again, 174874. Come on, come on up and claim your prize. Congratulations. There you go. Thank you. All right, our next item. You can put it back in, yeah. Our next item is going to be a meteorite. Ticket number is 1748527. 1748527. 
Shout out loud if you got it. All right, Dr. Weissman. <laughs> Apparently, he's already got some in his collection. <laughs> so we're going to draw again. Thank you. Number is 1748200. One seven four eight two zero zero. Anybody a winner? Uh, Dr. Baca's got to check his tickets too. Over here, one one more time. One seven four eight two zero zero. All right. Now you can start your own collection. <laughs> And the last item we're going to auction off is a, a photograph. This is an actual photograph taken by one of our students who took astrophotography this last fall, Claudina Evans. You want to stand up? This is her photo. <laughs> she took this photo um, with a uh, solar telescope, a Lunt LS80T for all of you astronomy techies out there. <laughs> <clears throat> and the winning number is one seven four eight one six two. One seven four eight one six two. One seven four eight one six two. Have we got another from the front table here? Oh, same table. Congratulations. We'll be doing more raffles later today. Thank you, folks. All right, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your meal. Congratulations to the winners. How many of you are having the short rib, by the way? Short rib? Raise your hand if you're having the short ribs. Very good, very good. They're delicious. But I ask you, what is the difference between short ribs and a small rock entering Earth's atmosphere? One is meaty, but one is a little meteor. <laughs> Now, speaking of some out-of-this-world people, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Manuel Baca again and Professor Julie Brayali from Earth Sciences um, and co-chair of the um, Department of Earth Sciences and Astronomy. They're going to come up and they're going to recognize the two recipients from 2021. Each of them received a $1,000 scholarship, as well as present this year's $1,000 Kepler scholarship Come on up, they're up. See, they were so close by. Take it away, Dr. Baca and Professor Brayali. Professor Brayali and I are very pleased to be able to present uh, these awards. And I am going to first present the, the awards for last year's uh, scholarship recipients. And uh, we want our photographer up here somewhere. Okay. Uh, let me uh, first present to uh, uh, Jennifer Castaneda. Jen. And then the other scholarship recipient for last year is Claudina Evans.
Hello, my name is Julie Braley. I am one of the faculty members at Mount San Antonio College Astronomy Program. Sarah Griego is truly a deserving student of Kepler Scholarship. Sarah was one of my best students from fall 2021 term. Sarah now works with me as a lab assistant. My lab students and I really appreciate her help. I am looking forward to working with her and learn about her journey as an astrophysicist for many years to come. Congratulations, Dara. Hello, I'm Sarah Griego, and I'm honored to be a recipient of this year's Kepler Scholarship. I'm a first year physics major at Mount SAC, and my goal is to pursue a bachelor's degree in physics with a specialization in astrophysics. I want to thank my mother for always supporting all of my academic pursuits, all of my friends and fellow officers of the Astronomy Club for their inspiration and support. And I extend my deepest gratitude to Julie Ray Ali. Thank you, Julie, for all of your support, encouragement, and guidance always. And finally, I want to thank all of the donors to the Kepler Scholarship, without whom this award would not be possible, and to the committee for selecting me as a recipient. This experience has been an overwhelming honor. Thank you. Sarah, come on up. Come on up, Sarah. And Sarah is joined this evening by her with her mother, Ines. Ines. going to draw a couple of uh, numbers for those quizzes that you have been taking. So this time I would like you to have your white tickets in front of you. By the way, I want to point out that the food is delicious and it's cooked by our students. But I also would like to point out uh, this year's photographer, Ellie is my student photographer and she's volunteering for the event, thank you. Okay. Do you wanna? I don't know where my script is. Oh. Um, got the bright lights here. Joe, settle down, okay. <laughs> Uh, we're here to do the, the uh, quizzes, and we're here to do the, um, the scavenger hunt. Okay, so let's see. Dr. Scroggins, you pulled a lucky number. You pull your own from the back. Okay, let's see. The lucky number, this first one is 0484. Five, nine. Do we have a winner? Oh, so close, Edgar. Anybody? Let me read this again. Zero, four, eight, four, five, nine. Oh, yay! So, what's your name? Ashley. Ashley. Okay, you, not two, just one. Um, so the way it works now, he gets the first choice to go out and choose the image he wants along the south wall, okay? So you get to choose. And if you get the Saturn one, it's coveted. There's people that would buy it for double the price, and you have to share with the Kepler, okay? Yeah. No? He goes to Wall in High School, yeah, yeah. He's, okay, so go ahead and choose what you want back there on the wall. No, uh, oh, you brought them, they brought them in. Yeah, but you have a 
favorite one? This one? Saturn's always so cool. Sure. Okay, so the number selected is 048549. Oh, wow, <laughs> oh my goodness. You're right, maybe. Let me introduce one of my favorite people on the school board. This is uh, Tony Thorne. Dr. Thorne is the president of Walnut Unified School District now. I've known him for about eight years in that role, and great deserving. So, um, take thank, you, thank you. It's my so, which one would you like? Yeah? Okay, let's see. Zero, four, eight, four, one, five. Wow! Oh. Well, good. So I think many of you guys may have met Adam. Um, he was helping us with the uh, the wine at the bar. He's a 2014 Kepler winner. Yeah, eight years ago now. Yeah. Congratulations. Nice. I know. And Desiree is here with us with her brand new baby. Okay, thank you. We have four, eight, four, zero, five. No one. Let me repeat the number again. That's a lucky table for this round. So while he's walking up, I'm going to go ahead and get another draw. All right. Way over here. So these are the photos taken by our astrophotography pick course. One. What is it? Pick one. Yes, pick, oh. pick whichever. The, oh, nice, please. So these are the images taken by our astrophotography students. So these are truly unique. Through our telescope. Through our telescope. Yes? All right. Uh, next number, 048493. <gasps> Yay! <laughs> Which one would you like? 493, right? Yeah, 493. Perfect. Oh, nice. Thank you. So these. Student photography has the uh, information on the back, uh, who was the uh, artist, took the image, and a little bit about the, uh, the image itself. May I have Philip, uh, Professor Phil All right. Phil, pick up a lucky number. Oh. It's a good number. Is it? Okay. <laughs> One more. All right. Well, two more on this one. Okay. Well, this one. Zero four eight 
four, zero, two. Okay, let me repeat the number again. Zero, four, eight, four, zero, two. Great. Since you're the lucky one, can I ask you to pick the last ticket out of the, the bucket? Gary High School. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, coming from Gary High School, uh, whichever of them as you like, and let me read the last number. Nice. Zero, four, eight, three. Three, four. Last three digits, three, three, four. Wow, that table truly is the lucky table. I want to tell Joe, gentlemen, we're going to take that table back there, Joe. We're going to bronze it and keep it in the science area because it's a winning table, right? Here's Heather. I have the results of the uh, silent auction. The winner of the goddess nature statue is, and I apologize for any mispronunciations here, Maria Chung. We've got a lot to go through, so I'm going to ask for applause at the end. All right. We've got the Sarev meteorite, Victoria Espino. Uh, the Rumani chondrite meteorite, Carrie Fowler. The 4K TV, Cindy Heisch. Uh, the Audrey Hepburn basket, Matthew Judd. The Sercho Sandrite me a necklace, also Matthew Judd. The indo um uh, meteorite, that's Connie Kunkler. Uh, planetary and birthday party, Connie Lowe. The Skworsky crystal necklace, Matthew Martinez. The handmade eclipse quilt, Matt Povich. The dream it, be it astronomy basket, Maria Rivera. The Sercho Sandrite meteorite, the one that's not a necklace. Uh, that one's Morris Rodriguez. Uh, the tea infusion kit, Rosa Royce. Tiki time, also Rosa Royce. Document camera goes to William Smythe. The cheers basket, Tony Torn. Uh, tea Time Basket, also Tony Touring. The Chondrite Meteorite, Matthew Wendell. And the Impact Glass, also Matthew Wendell. Special thanks to all of our silent auction donors, uh, especially the Bacchus. Thank you very, very much. And a uh, shout out to uh, Panera Bread, who donated the snacks for our volunteers who helped set up this beautiful hall for you guys. Thank you very much. To claim your auction items at the end of the speaker's remarks, you're welcome to go to the auction hall where Annette will greet you and help you check out your items. Thank you. All right, everyone. We're coming to the moment you've been waiting for. It's my honor to announce this year's Distinguished Kepler Lecturer. Everybody's still enjoying. They're, they're reeling after winning all those prizes. Yeah, whoo! That was great. That was like a meteor storm of prizes. That was, see, that was right off the top of my head. Our speaker tonight will be introduced to you by Dr. Bob Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a retired JPL NASA senior scientist. He's a member of multiple NASA missions, including the Voyager and Cassini projects. He was project scientist for Deep Space One mission, 
Currently, Dr. Nelson runs a research lab right here at Mount SAC, allowing our students the rare opportunity to engage in cutting edge research in astronomy. Please help me welcome Dr. Bob Nelson. Thank you very much. And it's great to be back together after a year off. And a year off was a pretty tough one for us to take. Because in that year, a year ago, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse came, apocalypse came and forced us to cancel the event. And because of that, the other three have appeared and are haunting us today. And it's important for us to remember that because an event like this of people who seek knowledge and seek understanding is the only way to stop those four horsemen dead in their tracks. So if you're gathering here tonight is an important re-giving of, 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 that, of that important experience. We learn more about what potentially could affect us. We need to know it as well as ourselves. Our guest, our speaker tonight, has spent his entire career trying to figure out what happens with objects that come from the outer solar system and perhaps threatened us and threatened our very existence on Earth. I first met him when I worked in the door at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a postdoc. He was in the office next door. And we, became, we had offices adjacent to each other for all that time. <clears throat> We had our, our uh, battles with the JPL, uh, science, JPL science structure. We had our battles struggling our way to get missions together, get our, get our science done. And uh, Paul has done that job uh, uh, in, in, in many ways. He um, got his, his uh, college, his high school education at Sheepshead Bay High School. That's in a place called Brooklyn. That's not New York, that's Brooklyn. And he then went to Cornell, where he got a bachelor's degree. And then he went off to UCLA working on his doctorate. And in the course of UCLA, he became exposed to JPL. And he became a very important contributor to the uh, Galileo mission that went into orbit about, about Jupiter. Uh, the part that I think you, the, won't see about him if he does, does just a straight, texture, uh, straight uh, lecture, is you'll miss some of his lovely sense of humor, which I hope he will inject into these remarks today. It's a real pleasure to introduce an old friend, Paul Weissman. OK, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Bobby and I were almost office mates at JPL. He walked into my office one day and said, hi, I'm, I'm your office mate. And he was smoking a stogie. And at JPL, your office mate can be the most unclean person in the world. They can have the worst habits in the world. But there's only one thing they can't be, and that is a smoker. Now, Bobby's given up smoking, and, uh, but we still spent almost 40 years with offices next to, door to each other. And um, the JPL management would have actually have had a lot less stress and difficulty if they realized they had put us next to each other. <laughs> because we were not the most reverent uh, scientists they ever had. And so we had a lot of fun. But thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's a real pleasure to do this. Mark Burita has been pestering me forever uh, to do this talk. And I look through the list of all my friends who have already done it. Um, so he finally managed to beat me, beat me into uh, submission. Uh, which is why I have the cane, of course. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, but uh, he's very persistent, and there's a lot of friends of mine have given this talk before, and I'm uh, very happy to um, 
uh, to be able to do it for you tonight. Uh, my specialty is comets. I'm interested in comets because they're uh, very primitive bodies that formed in the solar system when the planets were first forming. They're actually older than the planets. And they um, uh, have compositions that are very unique in that they uh, 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 are material that we don't see so easily in the solar system today. Uh, the reason is, and I'll show in my talk, their comets are for the most part stored in the outer solar system and uh, it's only very fortunate that the dynamics of the solar system sends uh, comets our way and we can study them up close. So I'm going to be talking about a mission called Rosetta. Uh, Rosetta is a European mission. It um, was conceived in the late 1990s uh, and uh, uh, it involves all the, Euro the European nation nations, but it also included, they were very nice and friendly and invited some Americans to come along. So, so some of the scientist instruments are from Rosetta, uh, are uh, from Europe, Most, a few are from the US, and um, they, ha they had a position on the mission called interdisciplinary scientists. We were the comets, we were the scientists who actually knew what a comet was, or we thought we knew what a comet was. And um, uh, we were invited to come along and tell the engineers and other scientists what to expect. We weren't always right, but we did our best throughout the mission. So there were five interdisciplinary scientists. I was the one American among them. One was a specialist in studying the atmosphere of the comet called the coma. Another was a specialist in studying the interaction with the solar wind. But my job was to study the nucleus. And here you see a picture of the nucleus. This is the comet we went to called Churyumov gerasimenko not easy to say, but um, it was discovered by two Russian astronomers around 1967, so they got to uh, have the comet named after them. And if you can look right away, you can see there's a hell of a c complex object. No one knows what's going on here, and uh, I'm not sure we yet know. Okay. A little bit about the, the, the architecture of the solar system. Solar system has eight planets pushing the right button. Can anyone see that? Oh, well. Okay, well, the solar system has eight planets. They're shown here to scale, but not to the distance scale. Uh, the inner four planets are called the terrestrial planets, which means they're Earth-like, and they all have iron cores and rocky mantles and crusts. Uh, so they're similar uh, in many ways, but as you can even see in this photograph, um, they're different from one another. They're very different from one another. But these are the planets we know and love, but uh, unfortunately, these planets have been highly processed during since the solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, the Earth itself was totally molten, as was the moon. Uh, and so they don't retain a great deal of uh, detail about what they were like when they were forming. Uh, and as we go through the whole solar system, beyond the four terrestrial planets, you see the four giant planets. These are giant uh, balls of, of uh, gas, uh, hydrogen and helium, that uh, have similar composition somewhat to the sun. They also have solid cores, but they're buried very, very deep below these very huge, thick atmospheres. Uh, you see Saturn with its beautiful rings. Um, but the, the, if we want to know how the solar system formed, we have to go to look at the small bodies. And the small bodies are stored in the asteroid belt, uh, which is between jo uh, Mars and Jupiter and contains primitive material that never formed into a planet. Some people think it's a d disrupted planet. That never happened. Uh, this is all material that formed, but because Jupiter was nearby, 
Jupiter started stirring up the orbits, and the orbits started becoming, rather than accretional, where the things would come together and stick, the orbits became destructive. The impacts became destructive. So we have a lot of ground up material in the, inner be in the asteroid belt, but, but it's not been processed very much. So the meteorites that come from the asteroid belt uh, tell us about what the solar system was like four and a half billion years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, they've been a tremendous source of knowledge. But again, but a different problem is that the, med the terrestrial planets are in a warm zone. The giant planets are much farther from the sun, so Ju even Jupiter is only five, is five times the distance of the Earth from the sun. So the, the, in the, in the um, asteroid belt, the composition goes from rocky to what we call volatile rich. Volatiles are things that are gases at room temperature. So water is an ice at the Earth's poles, but it can't, it doesn't, um, uh, excuse me, uh, it um, uh, is solid in, out in the asteroid belt. Uh, the giant planets is the, where the comets formed. It's cold enough for ices to condense. The ices mixed with dust and uh, gas from the solar nebula and formed the comets, which are typically big, dirty snowballs about a few kilometers in diameter. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to take my jacket off. It's a little warm. Thank you. And so, um, the comets formed among the giant planets, but, but they're not there now. And what they were, what happened is they were scattered by the gravity of the planets to much more distant orbits. Uh, in fact, orbits that go halfway to the nearest stars. And that's formed the Oort cloud, which is a giant spherical cloud of comets that surrounds the entire solar system. Uh, in addition, there was icy material left over beyond Neptune that formed a belt of material, which we call the Kuiper belt. It's analogous to the, to the um, asteroid belt in that it's material that didn't have time enough to form into a large planet. Orbital periods out there are hundreds of years, and the dust and gas did not run into each other as they orbited the sun. Okay, so what is a comet? Here's a picture of Hale-Bopp, the last really bright naked eye comet. Uh, I was taking my mother up to the San Gabriels to see uh, the comet, and she said, are you sure you were going to be able to uh, see it? And I said, yeah, there it is right through the windshield while we were still on the 210. <laughs> it, it was quite an amazing sight. And what you see here, does this point did not work at all? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, it's not very bright. Um, the head of the comet, down there to the lower left, is the atmosphere coming off of the nucleus. And we'll talk about the nucleus in a second. Uh, the nucleus is, is a, um, a big ball of uh, dust and gas. The gas is, because it's cold where they formed, the gas actually com becomes ice. And it's about um, the uh, head of the comet, which you see down there, is about 700,000 kilometers in diameter. I, I apologize, I speak met metric. A kilometer is six tenths of a mile. Um, but so that's, that head of the comet down at the lower left is actually about the size of Saturn. Uh, and it's gas and dust that are boiling off the solid nucleus and start interacting with the solar, solar wind and solar radiation pressure. So the, um, the, uh, the coma is interacting first with the solar wind. Solar wind gives the gas molecules a charge and that results in the little, in the blue tail you see, which streams directly away from the sun 
and the tail is, um, in fact, proof that the solar wind exists. Before anyone knew there was a solar wind, the tail of comets could explain it, uh, could be explained by it. Okay. On the other hand, the dust is very fine, micron-sized dust. Micron-sized dust is comparable to cigarette ash, and that gets blown back by radiation pressure. Just the photons, the bits of light coming from the sun hit the particles and have enough energy to actually push them backwards away from the, from the coma of the comet and um, uh, form this big, broad tail. So there's two types of tails, uh, but what's the source of all this? And the source is the nucleus. Nucleus is too small to see here. It's very dark. It's very black in color. Uh, but the um, uh, uh, and it's also too small to resolve. In this kind of a photograph, 10, uh, 10 kilometer, five kilometer object is too small. The, the nucleus of Hale-Bopp we think is 10 or 20 kilometers because it, it's a particularly big active comet. Um, by the way, just this comet was so spectacular, it was on the opposite side of the sun from us. So it's actually quite far from the Earth, as far as it could have gotten. Okay, but here, thanks to the glory of spacecraft, we can send visitors to take pictures of the cometary nuclei. And the first one at upper left is Comet Halley. Uh, taken in 1986 by a European spacecraft called Giotto, and um, uh, it's about 10, 16 kilometers long by about four kilometer, uh, eight kilometers wide, uh, or about 10 miles by five miles. And this was the first proof that there actually was a solid nucleus. Uh, there was a lot of theories floating around that comets were just banks, big dust banks of sand and, and gas. Uh, but this proved that there was a solid nucleus for each comet. The other comets are, in this picture, are what we call periodic comets. Halley is periodic, but it comes back every 76 years, and it actually goes around the sun the opposite direction from the planets, which we call retrograde. It's a going in the wrong direction, which tells us its origin is probably from the Oort cloud where other comets have very high inclinations. But the other comets here, the five, the four you see, are, um, are periodic comets, and they go around the same direction as the planets, and they have periods of anything from six to 20 years. Okay. What always amazes me about this particular photograph is that the comets are so different from one another. You have the one on Ville 2 on the far left is covered with these flat basins. They're not impact craters, uh, but it's completely covered with that kind of morphology. On the other hand, Temple 1 on the far right uh, has got a very evolved surface with lots of flat areas covered by dust. So trying to understand this family of objects that are all supposed to be similar to each other is a big challenge. Now, part of that challenge is all of these flybys, all of these photographs were taken by flyby spacecraft. That means they didn't stop and t sit around and take pictures. And so imagine if you wanted to fly by Los Angeles, but at six kilometers per second, four miles, four miles per second, you wouldn't get a, get a very good view. you fly, flying by on the on the freeways, uh, you'd only have a few minutes where you were close enough to downtown Los Angeles to actually see the structures and the buildings that were there. So these, these comets were great. They told us a lot about variety. They told us about possible processes. But what we really wanted to do was stay at a comet for a long time. Then we could see how it evolved, how it developed, what kind of phenomena. We could make repeated measurements and so on. Uh, so if you think of it, um, these missions here 
that for, gave us the first photographs of a comet um, were like just driving through a city and looking out the window as you did. The, what we wanted to do was stop, get off the freeway, and look at the comet very carefully. Okay, this is Rosetta. This is a European spacecraft um, that was um, built in the late in the 1990s. Um, at the top left, you're looking at the f one face of the spacecraft, where the um, uh, you're looking at the side that has all the science instruments on it. All of those instruments were pointed at the comet uh, during the encounter, uh, and we could explore around the comet by going uh, different places, maneuvering the spacecraft. The comet has very weak gravity, so we actually could put the spacecraft in orbit around it. Um, and I'll try the pointer one more time. Uh, I'm not seeing it very well. There it is. Yeah. Anyway, in that top left picture, um, uh, all the instruments are looking out. The two red ellipses that you see are star trackers. They allow the spacecraft to measure its position in space very accurately so, and to point it where we want to point it. Um, right below them is a sort of uh, white ring. That's the narrow angle camera. It has a cover that can both open and close. Anything you see on the spacecraft that's red is something that's going to be removed uh, before launch. Um, uh, of course, uh, we have to have the star trackers. We want to be able to actually see what's going on, but we want to protect all these surfaces while they're um, still in the clean room in, in, uh, in, um, at the spacecraft center. Uh, the top right is a picture of the spacecraft in what's called thermal vac. To test every bit of the spacecraft, we put it in a giant chamber, we, pull, we suck out all the air, uh, we have big Klieg lights that um, uh, shine on it to duplicate the uh, heat of the sun, okay, and we try to operate the spacecraft uh, to see if it will do everything we ask it to do. We can't test it in zero gravity, which is where it's going to be flying, but we get as close as we can without that. Uh, the lower left, you see one of the solar panels deployed. It has two huge panels that generate about six kilowatts of energy at one astronomical unit, one, the distance of the Earth from the sun. But uh, when the comet, we go out to meet the comet, that's going to be at four astronomical units, four times the distance of the Earth's sun. Gravity, uh, sunlight is a lot weaker there, so we need oversized solar panels to make sure we still get enough light. Uh, enough electricity to run the spacecraft. At the far right, lower right, you see the spacecraft ready for launch. Uh, you see solar panels are, are folded up on each side. You see in the foreground the, the lander, which is mounted on the orbiter and will be released when we get to the comet. Uh, this is a list of all the science instruments. I'm not going to go into them in great detail, uh, but you, I, you can see most of them are from Europe. Two, the ultraviolet spectrometer and the, um, uh, where is it now? Microwave spectrometer. Microwave radiometer, spectrometer radiometer. Uh, we're, we're from the United States. In fact, the microwave radiometer was built right down the road at JPL. Uh, so there's one other instrument among the magnet magnetometer and plasma detectors that is also studying the solar wind and uh, uh, telling us about the interaction of the spacecraft with the solar wind, of the comet with the solar wind. Here's the lander. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, but all of the instrument, this was built by Germany, and all of the instruments come from Europe. So it has cameras, it has spectrometers, it has mass analyzers, 
uh, we're going to learn as much as we possibly can about what's happening. Okay, here's the, again the orbiter and the lander in the clean room at uh, Kourou. The French uh, launched their missions from um, French Guiana, uh, which is kind of interesting because you go there and the unit of currency, even though you're in South America, the unit of currency is euros. Uh, so anyway, again, anything you see that's red, sorry, uh, or anything you see that red is a cover that's going to be taken off before launch. And so eventually the spacecraft gets all tidied up in a, in a launch uh, nose cone, and it takes off on March 4th of 2004. Uh, this is about 4 o'clock in the morning, and we were down there waiting to watch this event happen. Um, launch is probably the, hot, the most dangerous part of a mission because you just don't know what that rocket is going to do. But, but the engineers, of course, work very hard to make it successful. Let's jump 10 years into the future. And this is a picture uh, of, from the spacecraft of the comet. And the picture at the left, you see a globular cluster. That's off, off part of the galaxy. That's not what we're interested in. But this one bright star there, one of the stars there, is actually the comet nucleus. So we're, we're seeing it, and that's where we're approaching. Uh, we can take, oops. Huh. Well. In this picture, you can see the typically see the comet moving, but there's some sort of problem with the with the uh, with the projection. Oh wait. Oh, okay. You can see it. I I can't see it. That's the problem. <laughs> Someone turn out these lights right overhead. So anyway. We can see, and at, notice as the comet gets more active, uh, moves along, it gets active. And you start seeing the coma and dust coming off the comet and uh, as it's getting active. Okay, well, here's one of the first big surprises. This is July 14th of 20, uh, 2014. Uh, we're, near the, we're approaching the comet still. We're watching it rotate, and it's not just a round snowball that we might have expected. It's a very strong shape of two comets stuck together, two comet nuclei. And we could watch it rotate. No one really had a description for this. I thought it looked a little like the Sphinx, but other people decided it looked like a rubber duck. <laughs> and so the rubber duck became the nomenclature for describing where you were on the comet. So you were on the head of the duck or the tail of the duck or so on. Okay. One of the interesting things, you can see also by the scale bar down at the bottom there, it's about five kilometers, a little less than five kilometers in size. It's about the size of Mount Baldy. So I'll give you a local reference. Um, but if you look, st try to study what's going on, again, if you can shut off these two lights in the front, which are blinding me. Um, <laughs> the, using Earth-based telescopes, we studied the comet, and we determined that it was rotating in 12 hours and 45 minutes. So that was, that's a typical time for a comet nucleus. But when we got there, it was rotating in 12 hours and 24 minutes. It had sped up by about 21 minutes. Why did this happen? It's because all that gas and dust, which is coming off the nucleus, is acting like a little rocket motor and spinning the comet up to faster values. It's um, 
it's something we were aware of probably was happening on comets before, but this was the first time we really could see it very exactly and, and measure it. Okay, well, here's a close-up as we got very close. We're going to define the rendezvous as uh, being only 100 kilometers from the nucleus. This is a few days before that. But you can see this very complex surface that has smooth areas like some of the other comets we've seen. It has very rough areas. It has these cra cratered See if those lights make it hard for me to see. Um, it has these cratered areas that look like impact craters, but they're not. They're not. The shape and morphology is not quite correct. Um, so we see some resemblances to other comets we've seen, but we what we see really is very very complex, um, complex geography geology on the nucleus surface. Hello. Okay, again, here's two pictures with, with you can see the size of it. Baldy is uh, uh, 10,000 feet tall, that's 3.2 kilometers. Uh, so you can compare this to the size of Mount Baldy. Uh, an interesting fact was we're taking pictures, we can measure how much light is coming off the comet, how much is reflected from the sunlight hitting it, and it's only 6%. It's very black. Uh, there's a colleague of mine who always used to say, They're, the comets are dark as the hinges of Hades. And I always wondered how he knew. <laughs> um, he know, may know now, because he passed on. Um, but he was an extremely good scientist, so I, I don't, don't want to bemoan that. OK, here's another. Close picture as we're flying around the comet. Uh, this is the tail of the duck at the bottom and the back of the head of the duck, of the rubber ducky at the top. Let's dive in a little closer. Hello. Okay. And what we see is one side of this head of the comet, the back of the head, is this very steep cliff. It's about a kilometer high, six-tenths of a mile. But remember, the gravity here is very weak. So if you jumped off the top of the, of the cliff, you would land about an hour later at the, at the smooth spot below it, and you'd land at about walking speed. So it's, when we're studying comets, we're looking at phenomena that are very different from what we have, what we're used to every day. Okay, and we have to um, change our point of view to understand what's going on. In the smooth area below the cliffs, we see evidence of a lot of dust that has pooled there. We also see boulders, which have probably rolled off the top of the cliffs. Uh, if you look over to the, desperately try to get this to work. Uh, if you look, I don't know if you can see that. Over to the right here, you can actually see trails of where boulders have rolled down the hill and disturbed the dust. Here's another picture of the nucleus. Uh, if you're looking at this picture and you see a lion looking to the left with a big flowing mane, and you see a schnauzer dog looking to the right, you probably should have hand your car keys to someone else on the way home. Okay. But in reality, here's another look at the neck between the two halves of the comet, and it's covered with huge boulders. Each of those boulders is the size of a house. Okay, so in understanding what's happening, we're trying to figure out how this got put together and how it is changing as we watch, uh, watch it evolve as it goes closer to the sun. We're starting out very far from the sun, about four astronomical units, uh, and we're gonna go closer and closer 
which is going to lead to the more ice sublimating, more dust being released, etc. If, if we stretch the photographs, you can do this with your camera and your cell phone. Uh, if we stretch the photographs to, to make them very contrasty, uh, we can actually see jets of dust and gas that are coming off the nucleus. And these get brighter and brighter. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. These get brighter and brighter. Oops, sorry. These get brighter and brighter as we find the button. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a theorist, not a technologist. <laughs> but we can see jets of gas and dust coming off the comet. So the comet is already active. You see little lights here. Those are stars in the background, which we use to navigate the, the spacecraft. Um, Here's a picture of the underside. This is the belly of the, of the rubber ducky. Um, we see um, yeah, there you go. We can see very smooth areas. We can see large boulders. They've, you can see here is, is a structure where boulders have likely rolled off the, off the top of it and landed down here in this flat, dust-covered area. <clears throat> this is a close-up of that boulder in the last photograph. Let me go back a second. Here's this boulder right at the center of the picture. It's about 10, kilom 10 meters in diameter. It's the size of a house. And what you can see when we go closer at it, it's made up of a lot of littler pieces, smaller pieces stuck together. And dust from the comet's activity, some of the dust has settled onto the top of it. Um, so this is a continuously moving, changing object that we're looking at. Next time, bring my own pointer. Um, this is one of the interesting phenomena we discovered on the comet. These are pits. We'd never seen this before on a comet nucleus. They're about 200 meters in diameter. They're about 200 meters deep. Uh, we don't know why they formed, how they formed, but they are active. The wall, the, where sun is shining on them, they are active. We don't see, this is the first time we've seen this kind of uh, topography on a nucleus. And as you can see in the upper right photo, uh, we can actually look into the pits and see jets of material that are coming off the nucleus, off the walls of the pit. We think these grow bigger and bigger and form some of those larger circular depressions that we saw. But they're not impact craters. They're actually sublimation features. Sublimation is the ice goes straight, directly from solid to, liquid, to a gas. We can also zoom in and look much more closely at the nucleus. I'm going to try this again. Here's the bottom. Here's the nucleus. Here's the bottom the flat side that we've been looking at. We can zoom in and, for instance, take this little slice, and that's this photograph up here, where we see smooth areas. We can see boulders. If you actually look carefully, you can match the pattern of boulders here to the pattern of boulders over here. Uh, and we can keep zooming in as we get closer and closer to the nucleus. And we can see it's a very rough terrain. It's very uh, sort of helter-skelter kind of agglomeration of materials. And we can get down to a picture like this one, where we can see details as small as 11 centimeters in size on the surface of the comet. And we can see evolution of the surface. Um, it looks here like this may be a layered region. 
Layers, why are, why are there layers? We don't know yet. We, we didn't quite expect them. And by the way, in this particular photograph right here, this black smudge is the shadow of the spacecraft. We're that close that the shadow of the spacecraft, it, only a few kilometers out to, we can see the shadow of the spacecraft on the, on the nucleus. There's other instruments. This is the microwave radiometer that was built at JPL. Uh, and what it can do is scan across the nucleus and, whoops, too far, too fast. We can measure the mass of the comet because it's orbiting and the orbital motion tells us how strong the gravity of the comet has to be to allow, keep it in orbit around it. Um, we can measure, that allows us to measure the density of the, copy of the co uh, comet nucleus. And what's amazing is it's less dense than ice. It's made of ice and dust, but a great deal of the interior volume is empty space. Um, we knew this was going to, we knew the density was going to be low, but this is the first really exact measurement we had that nobody could debate. Um, where am I going? Uh, it, it turns out that actually 70% of the interior of the comet is empty space. But it's not very obvious. Uh, and we call that empty space we call microporosity and macroporosity. Microporosity is if you have a rock and you look at the rock, it'll have cracks in it, it'll have uh, op little holes in it. Uh, that's porosity that you can only see if you look very closely at the object. On the other hand, we can have macroporosity which is like a pile of rocks, has empty space between the rocks. And we know from studying meteorites with compositions similar to the comet nucleus that many of them have very high microporosities, 20 to 40 percent. Because the comets that we, the comet itself has not been as processed as the meteorites that we recover on Earth its macroporosity is probably even higher. So um, th these are very important measurements for understanding how the comet formed and how it evolved. Uh, one last d detail at the end, we had a, a radar on the spacecraft that could look through the comet nucleus and it never saw any big holes. So that means that much, most of the porosity we see is microporosity. It's not macroporosity. Uh, and again, this is important in understanding the properties, physical properties of the materials that make up the comet. Hello. These are some of the co chemical compositions, uh, chem chemicals that we measured on coming off the comet. These are all gases. Um, and it's a great mix if you want to make life. Uh, we believe that the early Earth also had this kind of a composition, and these different gases contributed to making the first molecules life on, possible on Earth. Um, we can also look with microscopes at the dust. At the left is a dust particle. Uh, about half a millimeter in size. It's, again, the little individual, you can see it's made up of a lot of little individual pieces. Oops, uh, there we go again. Uh, it's made up of a lot of it, little individual pieces um, that are slowly falling apart. 500 microns is half a millimeter, so this is fine stuff. But you can see it's all composed of even finer stuff. And this is an atomic microscope that was also used to connect, collect samples 
and again, we see that e even these, the top, these pieces of dust we see are um, composed of even smaller and smaller stuff. This, again, remember this is the size of cigarette ash. Uh, so a few of the general results. One of the most interesting things uh, is that we found that comets have seasons. They actually um, go through both, we just call it winter and, and summer, uh, but there are times when the comet is very illuminated by the sun, times when it's not, and these cause the comet to behave differently as it goes around its orbit. Uh, when we got there, the northern hemisphere of the comet was exposed to us, and we um, watched it evolve with time. But as we got very close to the sun, the, um, the, uh, we evolved to where the sun was shining on the southern hemisphere. And it hadn't seen sunlight for six years. So it got extremely active and boiled off a lot of gas and dust. It's one of the reasons when we got to the comet, it was covered with fine dust in most areas. But when we went by the comet closest distance, closest distance and got close to the sun, the comet got extremely active and mass was transported from the active southern hemisphere to the inactive northern hemisphere. We determined that the temperature, com the conductivity of the surface was very low. In other words, if you turn on the heat under a frying pan, it got hot very fast. And because of that, most of the heat didn't get conducted into the surface where there was lots of ices and volatile ices that we were trying to study, it, it got deposited right into the surface layer and caused the gases and dust there to boil off. Um, this also means that heat doesn't get conducted into the interior of the comet very much, so it preserves that composition it had when it formed four and a half billion years ago. And we had an instrument to measure the magnetic field, but comets don't have magnetic fields of any sort. Uh, let me go on to the lander. Um, these are various artists' conceptions of, of oops, damn it. Uh, these are various artists' conceptions of what the, we thought the lander would look, the surface would look like and the lander would look like. This is the most accurate of these pictures. Um, I'm gonna turn a little bit here. Uh, I can imagine a spacecraft engineer being at, told, you're gonna have to land on this. <laughs> and that would have been very difficult. But fortunately, most of the surface turned out to be like this. And we could target the lander to a smooth area. This is the area we chose. We'd like to have the whole area smooth, but again, the comet is a very rough object. It's very difficult to find a big enough area within the accuracy of where we can put the lander. It's a very difficult engineering feat to say, land here. So here's an area, oops, back. Uh, here's the area we finally selected. This was the smoothest area we could find. 35% of it is not smooth, it's rough. So it was a very bold experiment to try and land on the comet. Here's a separation picture over on the left. There you see the lander, its legs have deployed, its antennas have deployed, its uh, uh, magnetometer has deployed. So everything at this point is going great. Uh, it took a picture back of the, of the orbiter overhead, so that was our little goodbye, farewell party. Uh, here's a picture, the, con the lander, we went to an altitude of 30 kilometers and we released the lander and it's falling 
just because of the gravity of the, of the comet. It doesn't have any maneuvering system or whatnot. And, oops. It's headed, if I can get the pointer to work. It's headed for this region here. The reason, the reason it's not directly underneath the lander is the nucleus is rotating. It's gonna take two to three hours for the lander to uh, fall from 30 kilometers down to the surface. And so this is going to be under the lander when it gets to the surface. There's another picture of the lander. There's the target, is an area which we call Angelica. And here's close-ups from the sp camera that's mounted on the bottom of the spacecraft. Okay, and here is where we think, oops, go back. Here, Here is where we think the lander landed. Okay, we'll go through that again just so you can see. Lucky, we were lucky we didn't hit this big boulder on the way down, and we actually hit in a very smooth area. And this is where we think it landed. Okay, let's go. The orbiter is overhead, and it's taking pictures as the lander goes down. It's over on the left here. We see a picture. This is a composite picture. Here's a picture of the lander as it's flying over the surface of the nucleus. Here's another picture of it taken about five minutes later. Another picture four minutes later. And here's the touchdown point taken about 20 minutes later. And there's no lander. There's just three holes that match up to where the lander should have been. Um, what we also see, here's the area, same area before the lander hit. You can see the terrain over here in the corner is the same, it's undisturbed. And here it is after it's been disturbed. Well, where's the lander? It's the lander bounced. This was unexpected. The lander actually had harpoons in it that was supposed to snatch the surface, grab the surface, and hold it in place. But in fact, here we are, 10 minutes after it was supposed to have landed, and it's, moved, it's moving in this direction on the, over the surface. Here's a picture where you can see the lander, the little red dot above the rim of this crater-like structure, this basin. Here's what we were able to reconstruct using the instruments on the lander. And we see where it was targeted to hit. Oops, damn it. I'm gonna figure this out one of these days. So here it was supposed to hit, it bounced, it hit the side of this structure, this crater-like structure, and it then landed all the way over here. And it hit twice, but, but very close, each time was very close at the final blow. Here is how the engineers Um, it came down, it bounced, it hit this region right in the center of this picture at the bottom, and then bounced higher, but came down and pretty much stopped about a kilometer away in distance. It was quite a, quite a big bounce. Here's a picture of the nucleus. The red circle is where we think it landed. 
we didn't know for sure, but a great deal of work went into the next two years of looking for the lander. By the way, the lander worked when it did land and started sending back pictures of the structure. So these are the best, oops. These are the best pictures you'll ever see of a comet nucleus, at least for a while. Um, here's the foot, one of the feet down on the left, the antenna for the radar experiment, uh, and this very, again, still complex geomorphology to the surface. This is one of the cameras looking up, and we're seeing a big overhang. Basically, we landed in a hole. And there's the lander. It took almost two years to find it because of that overhang. But you can see the... Um, you can see the body of the lander, one of the legs, here's one sticking up, another one sticking down. Uh, and it's, as I said, fell into a hole, which made it very hard to find. But for about a day, a day and a half, it sent back data on what it was seeing. And so here's some of the results. Uh, it photographed the, the landing, it, the uh, cameras on it photographed the panorama around it. Uh, there were, one of the feet was in contact with the surface, so it pounded probes into the surface, but they were, um, they hit hard rock after going about 10 centimeters in, and we couldn't go any further. The radar looked at the interior of the comet, uh, but we didn't find any, any voids, any caves, or whatever you want to call it, uh, inside the comet nucleus. And um, uh, because of the resolution of the radar, we know the things we couldn't find were less than 10, 10 meters in size. So there may have been small voids, but there were not large ones. There was no magnetic field. The sample drill, unfortunately, because the lander was on its side, did not obtain any samples. The gas measurements, they, didn't, they only obtained samples of comet atmosphere. Uh, there was an alpha, alpha particle experiment which determines composition, but it, can, it did not hit the surface, so it never opened. Uh, and we briefly recovered radio signals from the lander the following year, but it never sent more data. So finally, we spent the next two years. So? Oh, okay. Um, now, as we get close to the sun, the nucleus is very active. We can see all these jets of material, and we see outbursts. Here's three pictures of the nucleus. They're taken 18 minutes apart, and yet here's this very brief, very sharp outburst. Here's another picture of the nucleus rotating, and you can see all the different jets. Now you don't have to ex overexpose. You can just see them. And you can see at just the right point, you get a huge outburst on the, on the, on the nucleus. Here's another huge outburst that occurred. August 22nd is a little bit past when the comet got its closest approach to the sun. We continued to follow the comet all the way out. One of the last interesting things I'll show you is um, we saw evolution of the surface. So here's again the bottom of the comet. Here's that, um, uh, here's those big boulders we saw before. And we'll compare this picture to this picture. They're taken a month apart, and the surface has changed a lot. But we're not sure what's going on. Dust is being raised off the surface and blown away, but the surface continues to change in ways we can't explain.
So here's our final family photo. Here's the comet. This is taken from the lander while it was still attached to the spacecraft. This is one of the solar panels. Uh, this kind of science is continuing. We're get ready, getting ready for m missions that will bring us back samples from another comet, or even maybe this comet, because people feel we know this comet so well. And so I thank you for your time, and happy to answer your questions. No, the comet is four and a half billion years old. We know that because that's when comets formed in the what, solar what system. What did you learn from the isotope ratio? Oh, well, you're talking about like uranium and, and uh, yeah. potassium. I don't know if that was done. I don't think so. Um, could you, could you answer from the microphone for me? Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, the, I don't know if we did age dating because um, what we know from comets and what we know from the materials is everything there is four and a half billion years old. Um, and uh, um, I don't know of age dating being done specifically with comet samples, but um, I have very little doubt that this is an extremely old object that was formed at the same time the solar system was formed. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so as we transition from fossil fuel to electric, one of our issues is minerals. And our MIT graduates told me, oh, that's not going to be a problem. We're going to be mining the meteorites and the comets. Is that true? And if it is, how long are we from? How long will it take before we start mining? Uh, that's a good question. And personally, I doubt that that's going to be happening very soon. It's very expensive. I mean, this mission, this mission cost $2 billion, and that was just to go there, okay? Um, bringing samples back, collecting samples, bringing them back would be another very expensive mission. Actually mining it, I think, is going to be extremely difficult. Now, there are people who believe it, will, it won't be. They're wrong. <laughs> It's fascinating to think of, it's fascinating to try and use the resources of space. But one thing I've learned in over 40 years in this, in this uh, field is it's real hard to do these missions and it's real hard to bring things back, which is why we haven't never brought back a sample of a comet yet. We've brought back asteroid samples. But the only sa comet samples we have are collected at very high velocity, and they're, micro, they're millimeter-sized particles. And that's as fast as, you know, that's the best we could do up till now. So it may be tens of, tens of years before we actually can talk about mining. It's a lot easier to mine things on the Earth where we know how to do things and where the technology is there. You might want to mention the war of the sea treaty and the, uh, uh, what? Oh, uh, according to the UN, we own none of this, okay? You can't make a claim on the moon, though people have tried, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, the UN has treaties which says that we're all gonna develop space for everyone. There's not gonna, you can't claim, I own this mining deposit on the moon, okay? Uh, and hopefully that will continue. I don't know with Russia these days. It may not. Um, out in the back there, Mark. So, oh. so how do you reconcile the uh, thermal conductivity of the surface and the actual thermal conductivity of the surface? Because the thermal I can't hear you. Can you? Uh, the, the Well, like I said, the, the 
sunlight is absorbed into a fairly thin layer, which is why you have very volatile extreme ices like CO2 and carbon monoxide deep inside the nucleus. Um, we actually did a measure, one of the measurements we did was how much mass did the comet lose during the whole time we were there, and it was one-tenth of one percent, one part in a thousand. Okay, so eventually the comet's going to completely evaporate away. It may fall apart before that happens. Uh, a lot of people argued over whether the, um, the two halves of the comet were going to break apart while we were there. I never thought that was true, but it's also an eventual possibility. Yes, sir? Talk about the chemical composition. Yeah, this is something we've looked at a lot. Um, we actually think most of the material from space came from asteroids, not from comets. Um, and as I think I meant, in the outer asteroid belt, that tends to be more volatile rich, more water, more carbon dioxide, more of the ices that we see in the comet. And so our calculations say um, that the material that landed on the surface of the Earth which is similar in composition to the comet in many ways, uh, mostly came from outer asteroid, the outer asteroid belt. Um, you know, there are meteorites. I wanted to bring my meteorites, so I couldn't find them, uh, called carbonaceous chondrites, which are 20% water. Okay, so it's, it's very possible that those brought the, uh, what do you want to call it, the, the sprinkling of, com of chemicals that led to the formation of life on the Earth. But having, it's very unlikely that they actually formed life in the asteroids before they came here. Yeah. Okay, a lot of it was reconstructing the trajectory as accurately as we could. And the interesting thing, the spacecraft had a, ma the lander had a magnetometer on it which measured the magnetic field. It did not measure any magnetic field for the comet itself, but it could measure the orient, we could use it to measure the orientation of the, of the lander. And that helped us to, um, come up with a very accurate trajectory and eventually look long enough. Like I said, it's two years, almost two years of looking before we found it in the right place. Yes? Well, the outbursts come from near the surface, certainly, within meters of the surface. Uh, there's lots of different theories about them. One of them, when the ice forms very cold, it doesn't form crystalline ice like we have here on the Earth, like you have here in your drinks. Uh, it forms what's called amorphous ice. And amorphous ice, as you warm it, it suddenly converts to crystalline ice around about 153 degrees Kelvin. And that's an expo uh, exogenic re reaction, which means it gives off energy. And so we think that some of the outbursts are the amorphous ice converting to crystalline ice. Um, there's other things where you may have pockets of volatile gases that get opened up and exposed, and those could result in outbursts. There's a lot of different ideas about them. Yes, sir? Yeah, um, in the early solar system, everything's on different orbits. The giant planets are stirring the orbits with their gravity, and things just randomly will come together in that cloud of material. Uh, and uh, uh, the interesting thing, by the way, is that 
we see more nuclei, more of the nuclei we see are at least two pieces before that once came together. You know, um, Tiryumov Gerasimenko is the most extreme example. But if you look back at those pictures I showed you of nuclei in the, in the, or in the beginning, many of those were two pieces stuck together, the ones that were shaped like dumbbells and so on. So that's just the random nature of celestial mechanics while all this material is forming in the, in the early solar system. I'm going to ask Dr. Baca and Julie Brea Ali to come up. We really want to thank you for all of your perspectives, your expertise, and the wonderful uh, lecture that you shared with us tonight. And we have a little little token of appreciation that they would like to present. Dr. Wiseman, thank you very much for uh, sharing your important work and your insights. And uh, every, I mean, the kind of work that you do is really cutting edge. And we appreciate you being able, on behalf of the committee and Mount SAC, we do have a little gift for you. And Julie and I would like to be able to present that to you. We won't have you open it, but we do have a book here, Angel Adams, that, uh, and in addition to that, we have a creation here that was a, a partnership between my wife and the Mount SAC Ag Department for you to take, cacti. So oh, wow. we present these two on. For... My wife is smiling. She's so like this. In appreciation for you being Dave Villian. You it was just such a pleasure to come here and talk to you, and tell you about our work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weisman. Thank you very much. You. We'll make sure this is delivered to your car. Yes. I was sick a couple of months ago. And you can you can use you can use it on Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have uh, some more raffles. I think. Raffle. Yes. Yeah. Uh, after we do the raffle, I we do encourage you to visit if you haven't already the sports museum. It's it's really impressive and. Uh, Willie Daniels, uh, I'm going to look for his uh, photo. He was a member of the Hurdles uh, uh, team back in, uh, in the early 70s. And his coach was Don Rue. Mark Rue's son was here earlier, and I don't know if he's still here or not. But uh, make sure you do that, and then we do have some other things. Okay, so the first All right, the first one, uh, red ticket. One seven four eight six eight zero. One seven four. We have a winner. How many more do we have? And then we have the grand prize. We have the grand. Prize. Oh. One seven four eight two three zero. Eight two three zero. One seven four eight three three six. Eight three three six. Okay, right there. That one, that's a winning ticket. Uh, no, one more. Shake it up. This is for the tablet. I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> See? Let's show what it is. Maybe that should be the winning ticket. Oh. Ah. 
It's okay. The number is 1748640. Didn't I just call in? 8640. 1748640. Okay, maybe not. 1748438. 8438. 8438. Miss Aggie Key, member of the Walnut Valley Kiwanis. I think that concludes the formal portion of our evening, but we have something special set up for you outside. We have some telescopes so you can gaze into the stars, and most importantly, we have some dessert, right? Some dessert and coffee for you, so please, I want to thank you all so much for joining us for the 13th annual Kepler event, and please join us outside for some stargazing and delicious desserts. Thank you. Thank you.